Okay, I have 5.30, so let's uh, convene this September 2nd, 2021 meeting of the Board of Directors of the San Lorenzo Valley Water District. Um, can we have a roll call, please, Holly? President Maygood? Here. Vice President Henry? Here. Director Ackman? Here. Director Falls? Here. Director Smalley. Here. Okay. Are there any additions or deletions to the closed session? Well, staff has none. Um, so this is the time where we have oral communications from any members of the public. And let's see, I see. Is that is Detlef Adam a member of the public, or is that some of the uh, thing for us? He is know? a member of the public uh, tonight, okay. but is also uh, an employee of the district. Okay, so um, this is a time for oral communications regarding items uh, that are being addressed in the closed session. Is there anybody that like would like to speak to that? Okay. If not, um, then we will adjourn to close session. I see you there, thank you. Mm -hmm. So Detlef, I wanted to let you know that um, we are, um, the meetings, the open session meeting starts at 6.30 rather than 5.30, just to let you know. Okay, so I have 6.30, so I would like to convene the September 2nd meeting of the Board of Directors of the San Lorenzo Valley Water District. And uh, we have no actions uh, were taken in closed section, session and nothing to report. Um, so we'll convene our open session uh, with roll call by Holly. President Mayhood. Here. Vice President Henry. Here. Director Ackman. Here. Director Falls. Here. Director Smalley. Here. Okay. Are there any additions and deletions to the agenda? No, staff has no additions to the agenda. Okay. Um, this is the time for oral communications from members of the public um, on items uh, under the purview of the district, but not on tonight's agenda. Do we have any members of the public that would like to make a comment at this time? Uh, let's see. I uh, I don't see any, so uh, with that, we will um, go ahead and go on to director's reports. Are there any reports from directors? I'm seeing none, hearing none. Um, we'll go to our first item of old business, um, which is, I'll turn it over to Rick to discuss that. Rick, you're muted. Yes, thank you, uh, Chair Mayhood. Um, we have uh, item 11A, the Pacific Gas and Electric Response, and the District's uh, Environmental Program Manager, uh, Carly Blanchard, will re report on this item. Carly? Great, thank you, Rick. So since 2020, the Board of Directors have written two formal letters to pg e regarding its community wildfire safety program. After the program rolled out in 2018, the district was concerned with vegetation removal and progress hardening pg es infrastructure, particularly on district lands. A response was received for the initial letter from P to pg e in June of 2020, but did not adequately address concerns. In 2021, a request for a follow-up letter was made to address the outstanding concerns in pg es response to the 2020 CEE lightning complex fires. The final letter was sent in April and a response was received on August 13th. The letter discusses pg es wildfire safety efforts, wood management policy and system hardening in Santa Cruz County. 
the letter addresses concerns raised by the district, however, does not offer immediate or direct solutions. Staff is requesting board direction on next steps concerning resolution of district concerns with each of these vegetation clearing and outdated infrastructure. Options include a follow up letter to pg and es regional vice president, Teresa Alvarado, contacting the California Coastal Commission and County, or awaiting the longer term solutions as suggested in pg and es letter. Okay. Um, are there any um, comments from members of the board? I guess we'll um, start with uh, Jamie, if you wanted to say anything about this. You know, I, I read through the staff report and the letters, and, and I, I guess I am um, not quite sure what to say, and I would be interested to hear from staff and if they have any solutions to this because I know this problem of, of um, you know, the the leaving behind um, the wood that's been um, brought down, you know, so many people in the Valley are dealing with that. And so I, I just don't know what the solutions are, frankly, um, but I'm, I'm open to hearing any suggestions anyone may have. Uh, any uh Anybody else would like to comment on this? Bob, did you want to say anything? I think Mark had his hand up first. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, I was just going alphabetically, but go ahead, Mark. Sure. Mark, if you want to. Okay. Um, Carly, you made uh, three suggestions for three potential paths forward on this. I have questions on two of those. Um, what do you think a follow-up letter to the California Coastal Commission and the county um, would attempt to convey or express in an effort to try to help move this along. So both of those agencies have been really involved um, with PG&E's stop and assist when they were doing the heavy vegetation clearing. Um, so they're mm -hmm. well aware of the issues. Um, so maybe just making us known that we are also having those issues, we can be included in their procedures that they're trying to pursue with pg and &E. um, You know, I haven't been heavily involved with what they've been pursuing with pg and &E, but maybe that's something staff can be involved with, and we can see if that would get us anywhere further with, with what we are looking for. You mean an effort to, um, if you hear anything different, let us know also we are interested in this issue. Right. Um, Okay, um, and then um, one of your, uh, the third suggestion was uh, just stay, essentially stay silent and wait for PG&E's uh, longer term solutions. Um, if we don't do anything at this point, um, in your mind, do we lose any leverage if, if we do that? I, I mean, sure, I think we would lose some leverage in the sense that we're not continuously pinging them and trying to ask for them to, you know, pay attention to our properties. Um, you know, I think a lot of people are pursuing these same questions with pg &E, So, mm -hmm. you know, falling back maybe in the line of who they're going to address first could occur if we just kind of stop, you know, following up at all. Um. I think we are the the fly trying to get the elephant to to do something in this case, um, and I think that there are dozens of similar flies or insects uh, of maybe various sizes. I don't know that any of us are going to get Genie to pay attention, given the um, given the size that they are. So. Uh, and I use some of my past experience. I offered PG&E a $50,000 bonus on a project while they were in bankruptcy, and they flat out turned me down for that uh, because they're not in a position to accept anything like that. Uh, so I have very little hope that we could move PG&E's needle on this. They're going to go through the process that they feel is appropriate for them this so okay thank you i i have to say that i totally agree with your assessment of this mark and i um you know i think we can hope um and 
if they'll make some movement on this. Um, and you know, if they, if they don't, we can try to do more. But at this point, um, I think sending more letters is, is not really a very good use of, of our time. But I, I'm open to other people's take on this as well, obviously. Lois, um, did you want to weigh in or Bob? I, I don't really have anything to say being a fly and the elephant could smack <laughs> me with its ears and kill me. I have nothing to say. I, I do have a couple of questions. Um, yeah, Bob. And you know, when you ask a direct question of somebody and you get kind of a non-answer, um, I'm Carly, I'm kind of curious, should should we interpret their letter as saying that no, they did not harden the infrastructure that they reinstalled across Palmer watershed property? Is that is that a fair um, interpretation yeah. of the letter? Yeah, if you read between the lines, yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean that's disappointing given the size of it and the fact that's a major uh, you know artery for them in and in, in and out. Um, but yeah, sure, they were probably more interested in getting power back on maybe than. Uh, right, and and maybe they didn't have the uh, equipment. I, you know, my other business supply chains are just all screwed up right now. It's it's really bad. Um, the other question I had, though, um, you know, they keep referring to a regulation or a law or something, and you know, when folks do that, you know, my first reaction is, okay, you know, it's probably right. They have lots. They probably have more attorneys than than we have customers. Um, but does anybody really know what that specific law or regulation is? Because I've been in situations where people quote something and they sound great, but you read the actual regulation and it's maybe not exactly what they're interpreting it as. Do we, do we know what that is? We don't. No. Um, it's, I tried to go through their website and tried to find the policy they're referring to. I believe it's their own internal policy, um, but I couldn't really find anything except for one excerpt that was in a um, FAQ on their website page. I, I mean, I think it might, well, I mean, and this again isn't worth spending a lot of time on, but I, I'm really, if you can't find something, I, I'm really skeptical there's actually legal backing mm -hmm. behind it unless somebody mm -hmm. says there is. Um, you know, uh, and maybe, and maybe that's just a question for the group that you referred to, that is trying to work with PG&E. Have they looked at that and actually verified that PG&E is on solid legal ground saying that? Uh, but beyond that, I don't know that I spend a lot of time on it. There's, it's more just trying to figure out is PG&E really being straight with us here or not. Um, I'd like to think they are, but the other part of the answer wasn't really very good. <laughs> So, they could have just said no. Sorry, we were busy or something, but yeah, anyway. At least we got this time the letter actually responded to us specifically. It was, you know, yeah. it responded to our questions and it was personalized in that sense, whereas the first one was kind of generic. So, sure. I, you know, when there who would make concerns? <laughs> yes. Jane, did, you, did you want to weigh in now after hearing what other people said? Um, yeah, I mean, so basically this sort of confirms what I was sort of feeling, but I wasn't sure if I maybe was, you know, there was something that I wasn't seeing that was an option there, but I, I agree. Like we're, you know, the gnat flying into the hurricane here. What are we going to get out of them that everybody else isn't also trying to get out of them at this point? Mark, you had your hand up next. Go ahead. So after hearing from everybody else, um, and in particular what uh, Carly said, uh, if there's a minimal effort that you can put in, Carly, into staying in touch with the Coastal Commission and the county um, in an attempt to uh, be part of that uh, group, since we're all in the in this local area and just to stay in touch with them to see if they're hearing anything different or if they're doing anything different. 
So I would support that, but on a minimal basis. Writing another letter back to PG&E, you're not going to get a I, good, I think good we, result. You know, maybe three mats together might have a little more effect. But I, so I, I agree that what Mark is suggesting yeah. that we should do that, but not right. bother crafting another another letter. Right. Spending bother, staff bother. time. Yeah, it's just not good. It's not it's not worth it. Time or yeah. committee time. Uh, Bob, did you have anything else you wanted to add? Well, actually, um, I, I fed everything through Mark, so um, <laughs> he, he said what I was going to say. You do. Okay, um, let's go out to uh, members of the public. Um, on on this, we we have uh, five people. Uh, anybody else? Anybody in the public want to make a comment on this? Um, please raise your hand. I don't know if people on the phone can raise their hand, so let's go ahead and um, make it possible for the person that's the phone number um, to speak if he or she would like to. Um, is there some? Is there somebody out there from? <laughs> I, I don't. There we go. Okay. All right. So um, whoever's on the phone on eight three one. Five eight eight zero five four zero. You're permitted to talk now if you would like. I don't think they want to. I guess they don't want to. Okay. All right. I just want to make sure. Um, so, hearing no public comment on this, um, we'll. I think we made um, it clear what we thought should go, and it sounds like the staff is. I, I think you know Rick and Carly are probably on board on this too, so that that's that's good. We're all together on this. All right, so let's go on to new business. With the first item being the Panorama Fiscal Year 2021-22 contract, Rick. Yes, and uh, our environmental programs manager will present this item to the board as well. Okay, okay thank you, Rick. Now, so as many of us are aware, the district began its work with Panorama Environmental Inc. in early 2020 to create a fire management plan. And since the district's initial contract, Panorama has been a valuable resource in post-fire recovery, grant funding, fire reduction planning, environmental permitting, and training. The fire management plan was approved by the board of directors in May of 2021, and staff seeks further support to implement management projects as outlined in the plan. Recently, Panorama has assisted the district in securing funding to complete priority projects as outlined in the fire management plan through partnership with the Resource Conservation District of Santa Cruz County and the California Coastal Conservancy, resulting in approximately $650,000 in grant funding with no cost share. Attached as Exhibit A is Panorama's fiscal year 2021-2022 contract scopes and fee sheet. Um, just as a note, Task 5 Forest Management Plan has an approved grant that will cover all costs upon reimbursement from CAL FIRE, and Task 6 Permitting Environmental Review and Agency Outreach for Implementation Projects has an approved grant that will cover costs upon reimbursement. <laughs> Staff recommends the Board of Directors approve the district to enter into a contract with Panorama Environmental Inc. to continue post-fire response, fire planning, grant writing, and oversight of fuel reduction, reforestation, and fermentation. Staff is prepared to answer any questions. And, and I'd like to add in that uh, this is new to the board that we did just receive another, um, what's in this memo, another $400,000 in fuel reduction. Um, that is, uh, we have confirmation that uh, we have been granted. So uh, that's just happened recently to bring that total up to the 650,000 in grants for fuel reduction. So that's been a great, great, Yep. That is excellent news indeed. Um, Mark, did you want to start with any comment on this since you're on the engineering committee? Excuse me, on the environmental committee. Sure. I have uh, no questions but two comments on this. Um, so the, if I'm understanding these grants correctly, the net fiscal impact is that um, 42000 minus those two tasks uh, costs for a total then of um, twenty nine thousand and change. Am I correct in that, Carly? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Um, second, um, the sub consultant of Panorama uh, Basin Research uh, 
they've done work for me on one of my construction projects. Um, I was happy to see them cited for the cultural resources. They're, they're knowledgeable about their subject matter, but they were also practical in um, helping me deal on a cost-effective basis for how to respond to agencies and do things uh, in, you know, to stay in compliance. So I was happy to see them there. That's all I have. Thank you. Uh, Bob, you're also on that committee. Did you want to make any comments or questions? Well, I, I had a, a couple of questions and a couple of comments. Okay. Um, uh, Carly, uh, is this in the budget for uh, this next year? Yes, we budgeted at fifty thousand dollars for this uh, type of work. Do you expect that uh, they'll come back for additional money? Potentially, I mean, if we pursue more fire-related grants and they end up providing that support, or we need, you know, they we've been working pretty closely with the registered professional forester that they work with, um, and they, so they subcontract him out to us whenever we need that type of work. So if we need more of that, that could potentially come back as a, a change order. Um, but it'll be dependent on how much we want to work with them, I guess is, is the question. Okay. Well, so far, um, what did we spend with them last year? 50K, 60K? I believe it. I believe it became um, more than what we had originally budgeted, which was the $60,000. Um, I'm not sure off the top of my head how much we ended up. We did do a couple different augments um, in that my, year. So. My point is, though, that, you know, the ROI in this is pretty good so far uh, relative to the grants. Um, yeah. did, the grant, did the grant writer that we engaged assist in any way with these two grants, or was this solely Panorama? This was solely Panorama. Um, we had started work with Susan after we'd submitted both of these applications for these grants. Okay, so we could, in fact, have two streams of grants potentially coming in, one from Panorama, one from the grant writer. Okay. Um, yeah, because we're not going to let our stuff burn. It doesn't really matter what's around it. It's, we're not going to let it burn. Um, the last thing is I'm hopeful once we get this major remediation done of clearing around our infrastructure, that the ongoing maintenance of it on an annual or semi-annual or whatever basis will be much less costly and that it can be done by local people. Um, very much want to start seeing money that we're spending on construction and this kind of maintenance work going to local folks if we're going to contract out. Um, it's, it's, it's a shame that we're having to do otherwise, but we, un I understand why. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Jamie or Lois, did you have anything you'd like to ask or add? Um, I, I just wanted to check in about, um, whether we are doing any kind of, um, you know, media release or letting people know about these fuel reduction grants as they come through. I know that we were waiting because we wanted to get the letter of confirmation, but, you know, I, I think that it brings comfort to the community to hear that we're being funded to do these activities. You know, people are very worried about their their own homes, and so they, they like to see that there's work being done in our community to help protect it. And I can quickly respond to that. We are planning our September newsletter, and that's going to be one of the featured items. And then we'll also be doing a lot of social media outreach on that as well. That's great. Okay. Um, we, we have a recommendation um, from the staff to um, direct the district manager to enter into a contract with Panorama Environmental to continue fire response, fire planning, grant writing, and oversight of fuel reduction reforestation implementation um, for fiscal year 21-22. Would anybody like to move that? I will do so. I can I'll second, second that. that. Okay. Um, before we vote on that, we should go out and ask uh, the public um, if they would like to comment. Um, on that. So if any of our attendees would like to comment or ask a question, please do so now. Seeing none and hearing none, I'll come back to the board then. Um, if there's any final questions or comments before we take a vote. 
Uh, just for a comment, we did go over budget last year. It was brought up with Panorama, but that was mostly due to the fire. fire where we actually changed their scope of work during the fire and after the fire. So, um, you know, otherwise they would have been within budget. Okay. Um, Holly, I think you can go ahead and uh, make a roll call vote now. Uh, President Mayhood. Aye. Vice President Henry. Yes. Director Ackman. Yes. Director Falls. Yes. Director Smalley. Yes. Okay. Uh, the motion passes unanimously. Um, with that, we'll go on to the next item of new business, which is the rate assistance program changes. Um, Director Rogers? Or Mr. Uh, manager Rogers. <laughs> I'll definitely uh, move this ahead and ask the uh, acting uh, finance manager to present this item to the board. And you have to unmute. <laughs> Welcome, Kendra. There you go. Did you unmute? You need to unmute yourself, Kendra. There you go. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Yes. Okay, there we go. Um, so it was discussed at the August 18th Budget and Finance Committee um, about updating some of the verbiage to the rate assistance program since we are no longer doing a uh, turnoff. Um, so the we updated the eligibility requirements in section 5.C and the continued eligibility requirements in section 7.2. Two, um, and it's basically stating uh, that if an account is 90 days past due, that they would not be eligible for the RAP program, or if in or to continue eligibility, if they are 90 days past due, they will be removed <clears throat> removed from the program. Um, and then it was also discussed uh, to update the monthly discount from $10 per month to $15 per month, um, but maintain the $25,000 budgeted cap. Uh, so it is re recommended that the Board of Directors review and approve the revised rate assistance policy. Okay, um, I'd like to ask uh, Lois to comment first since she's the Chair of Budget and Finance. Thank you. Okay. Am I unmuted? Yes, you are. I am. Okay. First off, I wanted to talk a little bit about property tax because that is what funds the RAP, the Rate Assistance Program. In 1978, Prop 13 was passed. Part of Prop 13 gave property tax monies to special districts. There is a little catch on this though. You had to be a special district when Prop 13 passed. If the size of the district was increased after 1978, only the original boundaries um, would receive property tax. SLVWD was a special district in 1978, but it covered a much smaller area than it does today. Basically, Boulder Creek, um, Brookdale, and um, Ben Lomond. There are two types of special districts, an enterprise district, which is uh, what SLV is because we charge a fee. A non-enterprise district are primarily funded by property tax. And a fire district is a good example of a non-enterprise district. Usually enterprise districts are getting about 9% of their income from property tax. Uh, non-enterprise districts get uh, 
primarily most of their money from property tax. Now, I, I'm not sure SLV is getting 9% of their income from property tax because the district is so much bigger now. And I have to admit that I, I didn't try to even figure it out. Uh, we do get a lot of, uh, of uh, property tax. Uh, one Lompico Water District was a special district in 1978. So when we merged with SLV, they did get a little more money, but it's not much. It's only 500 homes in, uh, in uh, Lompico. But like Manana Woods or Felton, uh, there isn't any property tax. And I, I can hear people saying, wait a minute, I see on my, uh, what happened here? <laughs> Did I go away? No, you're fine, go ahead. Uh, okay, something changed. Uh, they'll say, oh, hey, I see where I'm sending money to SLV on my property tax. But that is like, say Felton agreed to pay X amount of dollars to SLV. Uh, and, and some other mutuals also, or Lompico uh, pays money. But the property tax, you don't see how much property tax is going to go to SLV because it, the property tax is like 1% of the value of your home and the and sometimes it's 2%, but the county decides where the money goes. And so you don't really, there's nothing breaking that down on your bill. And I'm telling you about this because as we talk about raising the monthly credit given to low-income people in our rate assistance program, uh, there are some things I want to mention to people uh, about how we can continue to do this program. So, okay. One of the things we talked about in our August meeting was to raise the rate and it's from $10 to $15. And as was said, there's a $25,000 budget. And in July and August, we only had 61 people signed up. Um, and we have nine pe more people uh, wanting to be enrolled in this program. So if they finally get uh, signed up by before the billing goes out this month, then we'll have 70 people enrolled. And the cost of the district for those three months would be $1,920 if indeed July become, ha, makes, has 70 people. If the board would approve raising the monthly rate to $15 tonight, starting in October, we would not go over the 25%. Let's say some magic happened. And by October, we have 100 people enrolled. Well, I don't believe in man, man, magic, but I can't talk. Um, uh, but for kicks, I'm going to just say we're going to have 100 people enrolled for the next nine months, and that would be $180 a year for people who uh, get $15 a month. And, but if we have these um, 100 people enrolled for nine months at $15 a month, that's only $13,500. Uh, so with the first three months, we would be at $15,420. But 
but in case uh, magic happens and we get a whole lot more people than a hundred or we get the hundred, we have like a thighs nine thousand dollar wiggle room. Actually, it's a little. It's more than nine thousand, but it's not ten thousand. So let's say in the twenty two. Oh, okay. I want to say this next the next budget, the twenty one twenty two budget. If we um, if, if we raise the amount to $30,000 that we're going to give to, uh, that, that's in the budget, that would mean only 166 people could get $15 a month. But if we, so I, I should have said the 22, 23, I'm sorry. Uh, but if we have 208 people enrolled, which is the maximum right now, we would have to raise the amount to $37,440. Now, some of the members and public and whatever brought up that they thought it ought to be $20 a month. So 166 people getting $20 or $240 a year uh, would mean a budget of 39,840. Or if we keep the 208 number that are getting 240, that doubles the budget we're in right now. It doubles it to $50,000. And I, I talked to you about property tax because property tax does not double. It doesn't. And yeah, we have a lot of money in property tax. We have over $800,000. But the amount of increase that there that is in the budget for 2223 is $25,709. So if we kept, uh, gave people $20 a month and we kept it at 208, we're, we are spending twice as much as what is uh, the additional amount that's coming that year. So I think think we need to start thinking about if we want to have more and pe more people in in our program and we want to keep raising the price i don't i mean granted we do have a lot of money in property tax but can we keep increasing and increasing and virtually wiping out any growth in that program from year to year? Or um, can we find some other way to help these people or a, another way to fund the money? We cannot give district or ratepayers money away. That's why we're using property tax. So that's all I have to say. And I hope you have some good ideas out there. Uh, since I'm on the committee with Lois, let me just follow on to her com comments. The, the reason she gave us that short course on on uh, property tax is that, um, which is something that I, I didn't appreciate till she explained to me, is that um, we can't fund things like the RAP um, through our the fees that we charge our ratepayers. It has to come from some other form of uh, funding, which is, that's just the law. So that that's why um, we have to look to these other sources. Um, but I, I would like to go back to the, 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 the sort of rationale that the Budget and Finance Committee had in arriving at this 
two, the, basically two things that we're asking for the board to do is it, one is just to simply bring the, the program into being consistent with now how we're collecting bills and everything else. So I think that's a, you know, it's pretty just administrative. The second was raising it to $15. And the reason we did that is that we noticed that at $10 that we were really grossly undersubscribed. We, we know from PG&E that there's a lot more people um, that uh, apply to their care program than are applying to our um, RAP. And basically we're using PG&E's care program. And so the thought was, is that maybe, you know, at $10 a month, it's, it's just simply not quite people's worth their time to do it. So the thought was, is that we would raise it slightly. Um, some people, uh, one person from the public attended the meeting and suggested more. But I think one of the reasons I was didn't want to say raise it to 20 was that I kind of wanted to see what would happen I, if we raised it to 15, if that brought the numbers up and we, you know, I, I wouldn't want to have a situation where, where we double it and then suddenly we couldn't accommodate all the people that wanted it in the $25,000 that we've budgeted already. So I, I think that this is a, you know, it's, it's kind of an intermediate step. It'll help the people that are already enrolled, it might incentivize a few more people to enroll. We can, as Lois says, if we want to make this bigger in the future, we'll have to think about whether, you know, we, we want to do that. But I, that's not really in front of us right now. What, what's in front of us right now is really a pretty simple thing, which is just these administrative changes to the rules and bumping up the uh, amount that we pay people that are enrolled from 10 to $15 a month, staying within this $25,000 that we've uh, budgeted so far. So it doesn't have, you know, it's budget neutral. If suddenly we got a whole bunch of people applying, we would just, uh, Kendra, we would just go first come first serve, right? And um, so we're not gonna go over that. So I, I just wanted to kind of, so I, I hope that the board will just see this as a fairly simple, thing to, to, to do that might help out um, some of our um, lower income rate payers. Bob. Yes, I had a, I had a couple of um, questions just to make sure that I'm with you guys because I do appreciate Lois's tutorial on the property taxes. I think it's important for people to understand that. Um, are, are, we, are we talking about capping the program at 208? people regardless of money, or are we talking about capping it at $25,000? We are capping it by the budgeted amount, which is $25,000. Okay. My recollection is that the reason we selected the 25,000 is because I believe that's our cellular lease revenue. Um, the property tax revenue is typically used to cover debt service, um, or at least that's what it has historically been used for um, and uh, in the uh, p and l um, and so you know any money that you would take out of property taxes means you're taking it out of uh, applying it to our capital obligations being it debt service or infrastructure or what have you um, without replacing it somewhere else which you know may be raising rates to be able to cover that um, so that's one comment. Second comment is on the property taxes. We are in the middle of a, of a fairly significant demographic shift um, and where uh, properties that were assessed under Prop 13 at a couple hundred thousand, 300,000, they were you know, purchased 20, 30 years ago. Uh, people are, are starting to turn those houses over for one reason or another. And the current prices are up in the uh, much higher. Um, 600, 700, 800,000, even I've been starting to see million dollar houses in places I never would have dreamed that we would get to that point. So the, the property tax revenue over the next 10 to 15 years is going to change significantly at the county level. Whether we get any of it or not, I guess is, is still you know to be determined. One would hope so. Um, I, I think, Lois, you're about right. I think we're somewhere around seven, eight, nine percent of our total revenue is property taxes. It's about eight hundred thousand on revenue of what, eleven million, twelve million, something like that. So I, I think you're in the ballpark. 
Um, my solution, of course, for making uh, things affordable for people is, is very different than what is being discussed here. Um, if we apply the last eight years of rate increases and take that trend forward eight years, uh, we're looking at $200 a month bills for four units um, by 2030. I, I, I think in any scale, um, the only people that are gonna be able to afford that are not the people that live here today by and large. And that, that would be a real shame. I, I hate to see ourselves put in a position where we're forcing people out because of our inability to control operating expenses. Um, one quick comment on the policy. There's a small typo I just wanted to make sure we got. It's on the second highlight, uh, 90 days. Um, don't want people to think we're oh, kind of cut them off at nine days, um, which I know isn't the intent. Um, so I appreciate you bringing it to the to the board. I think at the end of the day, though, the solution is not at our scale. The solution is at the scale of the state. And you know, if we have seventy eight billion dollars that is being talked about, or whatever the number is, it sure seems to me that uh, the state legislators ought to step up, do the right thing, and start funding. Is it AB four hundred one, or I forget the number? But there is a bill that has been passed, they've just never funded it uh, through appropriations. And, and that's a real, and from my point of view, a real shame. That's where the solution is going to come from. We're too small to deal with this at the scale that ultimately needs to be done if we're not going to do anything about the, uh, the operating expenses. All right. Jamie or Mark, did you want to say anything? Um, I, I, so I, I was just going to say that I'm, I, you know, I'm, I'm not troubled uh, by by the proposal because we're we're still staying within, you know, the the framework that was previously approved for the Lyric program. So, you know, I, I think that it's it's reasonable to increase it. Um, you know, fifteen dollars is a more meaningful sum of money for people, and so um, I, I support it. Um. I'd like to go out to members of the public if they have any comments. Excuse me, President Mayhood. I just wanted to mention one thing. I um, wanted to let you know that if a caller wants to raise their hand, they can do so, so by using their phone and pressing star nine. Uh -huh. So if anyone wants to use, uh, call in and raise their hand, just star nine and your hand will go up. Thank you. Thanks. Holly, were you able to confirm if there was an issue with the link in the agenda tonight? Because I, I did get a text from someone that said that the um, a link online may not be accurate. Uh, yes, they were um, I've had message. some problems with it. And if you just try one of the other links, there's other ways to do it instead of just using that link. I don't know what happened. It must be, There must have been a typo in it or something. I generally just copy and paste, but for some reason it's not working. And we do have attendees that have made it on so it's not completely ruined it's still there is an option of getting on and if i could weigh in there quickly the link is correct there's just some kind of a break in it so that when you click on it 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 doesn't populate the url correctly but if you copy and paste it it works so it does work it's just a little more awkward than usual okay thanks for that Thank clarification you. gina um so do any of our uh members of the public uh, would they like to make a comment on this? Okay, hearing uh, none, seeing none, then we'll go back. Um, the, the staff has recommended that the board of directors um, approve the revised rate assistance policy. Would anybody like to make a motion on that? Chair Mayhood, I'm not sure the, the hand raising function is working for the current. We haven't had any comment from the general public. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, oh, oh there we go. Alina, okay. Just along this yay, thank you, Alina, for letting us know that, you know, you're alive out there. <laughs> go ahead. Oh, I, I, I'll, I'll raise my hand since you know it's working and also I'm total support of this. It sounds wonderful uh, to br bringing, you know, more money to people that need it. So thank you so much for working on this and, and thank you for, uh, Vice President Henry's explanation on the, you know, taxes. So thank you guys. Okay. Thank you, Alina, for letting us know that we're getting through or you're getting through. 
All right, good. Um, so anyway, I we have this recommendation from the staff that we revi that we approve the revised rate assistant policy. Would any member of the board like to make a motion regarding that? Are, is that including the fifteen dollars? Yes. The, the, I'll make a motion that we do that. Okay. And I'll I'll second that. Thank you. Um, Holly, would you take a roll call vote, please? <laughs> Director Mayhood, excuse me, President Mayhood. Yes, aye. Vice President Henry. Yes. Director Ackman. Yes. Director Falls. Yes. Director Smalley. Yes. Okay. The motion passes unanimously. With that, we move to the next item of new business, which is the uh, whether to open employee memorandums of understanding for negotiation. Um, I'll turn to District Manager Rogers. Rick, you are muted. Yes, thank you, uh, Chair Mayhood and District Council uh, Nichols will present this item to the board. Um, okay, thank you. Um, this is for those who've been on the board for the last uh, couple or the last few years, this won't be a new item. Um, this memo will look a lot like memos that you've seen before. Um, the reason that this particular issue is coming before you in, um, in September is that uh, in 2019, the district's two memorandums of understanding with its employee uh, groups um, came to the end of their term. So, uh, and, and maybe I should take a step back. Um, the district has agreements with its employees that establish a lot of the terms and conditions of employment. Um, they're set forth in memorandums of understanding. There's one with the management um, uh, supervisory and confidential employee unit. And there's another one with the classified employees union. They're similar, but there are some differences between the two. Um, one of the similarities between the two MOUs with the two different employee groups is that they have the same um, expiration and renegotiation terms. So both of the MOUs um, with both of the employee groups um, expired in uh, 2019, but they provide that they automatically um, uh, renew from year to year if they're not open for renegotiation during a particular window that occurs in September of each year. Um, so during this window we're now in, which is essentially September 2nd, October 2nd, um, the parties to the MOU, including the respective employee group, and on the one on the one hand and the district on the other hand, um, can decide whether to give notice to open the MOUs for um, for renegotiation. Um, or whether to, you know, allow them to simply uh, uh, renew based on the same terms and conditions for another year. So because the, they expired in 2019, the district now has for a few years at, the, at about this time of year, looked at the MOUs and considered whether or not to, to open them and also asked the employee groups what they intend to do so that in, or, in an effort to try to coordinate the process. Um, so we're in the window again. Um, the district, uh, the board uh, of the needs to make a decision on behalf of the district um, whether to open the MOUs for, for negotiation, one or both of the MOUs for negotiation. That decision is not before the board tonight. The decision that is before the board tonight is whether to appoint representatives um, who would handle negotiations if the MOUs are opened and if the board appoints representatives, then the then the board can meet in closed session with those representatives to talk about the district's position um, and among other things, whether or not to, to open the MOUs for negotiation. Um, so that's what we're asking for tonight is for the board to appoint representatives, um, including the district manager and myself um, and then, then we would meet with the board in a closed session, presumably at the next board meeting, or, or I guess it could be a special meeting, um, to talk about the MOU renegotiation process and what the district's position is. Okay. Um, 
Rick, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? No, I think council uh, summed it up. Um, uh, I think we are recommending that the board appoint district council and the district manager um, for um, uh, negotiators um, representing the district. Okay. Um, let's go ahead and see if there are any questions or comments from members of the board. I'll start with Mark. Um, now that I have the understanding of who the negotiators are that we would be appointing, no, I don't have any further questions. <laughs> okay, that was simple. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Okay, Jamie, how about you? No, I don't have any questions right now. Okay, Bob? Yeah, um, so I understand what you're saying is that just because you appoint negotiators doesn't mean you open negotiations, but um, isn't that kind of um, sort of a signal to everybody involved that, that that's definitely a possibility? I would, I would agree with that statement, yes. I'm, I, I may not be understanding this. We've approved a budget that has already built into it um, compensation assumptions, and we had some promotions this past year. Uh, I'm trying to figure out what the, um, you know, where, where, where that recommendation is coming. Because I believe last year there was no recommendation to do that, right? That's correct. Lois, did you have anything you wanted to add? You might be muted, Lois. Yes, you're muted. Lois, you're muted. Trouble. <laughs> Trouble. Um, I think it would be a good idea to have the district manager and uh, district council uh, be the people who deal with this. Uh, I think it's kind of up to the employees if they want to open the negotiations. If I'm wrong, Rick, tell me. Well, it's up to either, up to either side. Am I correct, Gina? It's up to the district if we wish to open up and discuss or the employees can, can vote to open and discuss. Yeah, that's right. Either or both sides could open the MOU and either way it, it, it becomes open for negotiation from that point. Okay. Let me just partly address Bob's point is, um, you know, we really haven't for the last two years opened this up, but I think it's fair to say that um, it might be, you know, a good exercise for the board, given especially that we have three really new members to be able to look at this carefully and um, discuss it. I, I think there's a lot of value there. But also beyond the question of what you were asking concerning, you know, that we've already approved a budget, um, the, the some of the things that, you know, potentially could change might have nothing to do with compensation. They might be, for example, as we've seen with COVID, the workforce has been transformed. We have people working from home. We have hybrid uh, solutions. There's a lot of other things that go into um, the agreements that we have with both our unionized and our um, other groups. Um, so one could imagine some of those things being discussed or, or codified as, as well. So I, I think that that's, that's what we're, you know, that's just, that's just an example of the sort of thing that might come up that has nothing to do with, with salaries. Bob? Okay. Um, so, I mean, is, aren't those the kind of things that get worked out between managers and the staff anyway? I mean, are we looking here to lock certain things into place? I don't, I'm not sure I'm following. Well, uh, given that a lot of our, uh, you know, that to a certain extent those are, but when you have, um, you know, a lot of our staff um, are the classified employees union, um, those aren't simply things that you sort of negotiate in that, that way in an informal manner. So 
Is any, of, is any of that covered in the agreement today in terms of working arrangements, remote working? No, that, that's the point, is that the work the, the world has changed <laughs> and that it's time that we discuss these kinds of things and, or have the ability to discuss, discuss them. Is there no ability to address any of that today? I mean, the, 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 this, this pandemic is not going to be stopped. I mean, we're going to be living with this coronavirus for many, many years. And, and what, what things may look like even two or three years from now can be very different from today. Um, you know, so, so the notion of locking things into place, I, I'm not sure that I, I understand that. It no, seems to me that everybody of good faith could be working on those items. Directly. To interrupt, I, this isn't the meeting to kind of have that discussion. Yeah. Um, this is the meeting to select negotiators, and there's times to have that discussion. No disrespect to the. To you're, the you're, no, I, under, I understand your, your point, Rick, and I didn't want to get, dive too deeply into it, but there, there has to be some reasons for doing this, and, and certainly in the manner of. of you know, communicating to our public why, why we're doing this. Well, we, we haven't even decided, Bob. So I think you're really jumping the gun and you're once again going to hypotheticals that are really far beyond what we're even talking about tonight. Once but again, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to understand the rationale. That's all, Dan. Mark? Um, yes, I, I think I'm following along with some of what Bob is asking. Um, Rick, what's the downside? If we don't, at this meeting tonight, appoint negotiators. Well, we have a we have timelines to follow. Mm -hmm. uh, both the, the the classified and the management team have guidelines and timelines, and we have the same. And it's better to start this process um, sooner than later. Um, you know, you don't want to wait to the last minute to a point. Um, we haven't got all indications. We have some indications that potentially employees may want to open. You know, we're not mm -hmm. sure um, on that. Um, you know, and, and, and we do want to review certain aspects of the agreement and not saying we're looking at compensation, but as, as Gail pointed out, um, the, the agreement is silent on such things as working as home, working from home, and it's caused issues uh, during the pandemic. Okay. Um, and by not having a policy or in writing, um, it, it causes mm -hmm. issues, you know, and, and then, the, you know, either the manager or employees try to solve that issue, and it's much better to have this settled uh, as part of the MOU. Okay, thank you. Does anybody else want to weigh in before I go back to Bob? No? Okay, Bob? Yeah, I, I appreciate that perspective, Rick. Thank you for, for going through that. I, I, I guess my question here is, um, if, I'm, if I'm understanding properly, is that we could, in fact, decide to not appoint negotiators until later and see if the employees really do want to open things up because I'm assuming one of their reps are here today. Um, but um, that wouldn't that would, know the, And the deadline is in uh, council's memo yeah. that we have to make a decision, the board does, am I correct? But, but, that wouldn't, but, but that wouldn't give us enough time to have discussions, at least at a regularly scheduled meeting about whether or not we want to open negotiations or not. So I guess the other question I would have is if we do appoint negotiators and we go into a closed session and typically our closed session are an hour, is that going to be enough time to cover this at the next meeting? Or do you anticipate that we're gonna have a special meeting or two before we get to a final decision? I would anticipate that we could come to a final decision rather quickly. Um, obviously, it depends on what other business is on the closed session agenda. But uh, at, at this stage of the game, I think we could come uh, to a decision on moving forward relatively quickly. And then we should have uh, word in writing from the two representative groups and have a better understanding. 
I'm actually surprised that we yes, could reach, we should have enough time. I'm actually surprised we could reach a decision that quickly. If that's the case, though, if we can do that, then I don't know why there's a rush to do it tonight. We could wait until the next meeting. The employee groups may wish to decide, or we could even wait a little bit longer. Um, if it's not going to take very long to do it all, and we could have a very quick special meeting to uh, to cover that later in the month. And I'm, you know, whatever the board's pleasure is and direction to staff, you know, we'll move forward with. Jamie? Um, I, I don't agree with having unnecessary special meetings. I, you know, I, I, I view that as an additional cost to staff and staff time that we have to pay for every time we hold these um, special meetings. So, you know, if it's something that would, you know, speed the process, it's not going to have a real big material impact and allows you to, you know, have a little more time to prepare. I, I, I'm, I, I would not want to put us in a position where this would have to be done by special meeting at a later date. Lois? You're muted. Lois, you're muted. I would like to motion that we appoint the district manager and district council to be the negotiators on this. I will second that. Um, before we come back to uh, discuss this more among the board, I'd like to go out and see if there's any comments uh, in the public. Are there any comments in the public? Seeing none, hearing none, I'll come back to the board to see if there's any more questions about the motion that's on the table. Bob? One quick question. Uh, once negotiations are opened, um, there's no limit to either the topics or the time frame in which negotiations are taken, correct? Any uh, Once they're open, everything's on the table. I do believe that's partially correct. Once open, everything is on the table. But I do believe there are time, time restraints and limits moving forward. Am I correct, uh, Tina? Yeah, well, once it's open, there's no limitation on which terms are conditions or potentially negotiable. Um, there are, yeah, there is a deadline to give notice that that is what it is. Um, but in terms of completing negotiations, there's no deadline. That's right. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it, they, it could go on months or it could go on two weeks, depending on how much gets put on the table. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. If, if uh, there's no other comment, I'd just like to sort of formalize the motion, if you don't mind, Lois. So <laughs> go ahead. Um, that we have a motion to appoint the district manager and district council as the district's designated representatives regarding negotiation of the district MOUs with the district's classified employees union and the management supervisory and confidential employee unit. Perfect. Okay. Courtesy of Gina, of course, I didn't <laughs> do that. Um, so uh, Holly, would you take a uh, roll call vote, please? President Mayhood? Aye. Vice President Henry? Aye. Director Ackman? Yes. Director Fulce? Yes. Director Smalley? Yes. Okay, the motion passes unanimously. Um, next, we come to the consent um, agenda, which contains items that are considered to be routine in nature. Um, are there any things that should be pulled from the um, consent agenda? Uh, Bob? Uh, yes, I'd like to, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, pull the minutes from July 15th. I have several uh, suggestions. Okay. That, that's fine. Should we vote on, uh, Gina, do we need to vote on the remainder of the consent 
issues or? There's no need to vote on the items that haven't been pulled. The only issue is the need to discuss and vote on the one that was pulled. Okay, good. Bob, go ahead and state your objections. Well, no, what did you say, objections or suggestions? Suggestions, comments, whatever. Okay, the first one is on item number 10, the third paragraph. There are, there's one typo, I think, on the next to last line to undermine what the majority decided should not be done. I think it is supposed to be should be done. After that sentence, I'd like to add, because this is a very expansive paragraph, it covered everything but two sentence or phrases that Lois had. So after that word done, I'd like to add, even though it doesn't say it in our board policy manual. And then the last sentence should be, you are selling your usual stuff while you are doing it. And that is to provide a more fair and contextual set of comments about what was said there during the, during her director's report. I would not at all agree with the first thing you said, because that's not what Lois said. I went back and listened to the recording today, Gail, and that's exactly what she said. Oh, sorry. You mean the not, striking the word not. No, that's okay. But what I'm saying is, did she say that the majority decided should be done, even though it's not in the board manual? Yes. And if you wish to pull this for another meeting so that you and I could review the tape, so we don't have to do it here in real time, I'd be happy to do that. Well, I just, you know, if that's, if that, I think Holly can determine whether that's exactly what she said. I didn't know I'm, I'm reporting exactly. I agree. I thought it was summarizing. But basically this paragraph summarized virtually everything that Director Henry said, except for the two things that I am adding, I would like to add. It covered everything else. It was not a summary. And I'm just going to state here for clarification that if there's going to be a change to the minutes, the board would need to vote on it to approve it. Minutes are approved. We understand that. Right. So, Bob, do you want to, I didn't quite catch what you wanted to do. So maybe, and I'm not sure if everybody else did, but would you like to restate it again before I go to Jamie? Yes. What I would like to do is make sure that this paragraph provides the entire context of what Director Henry was saying. So the first addition is in the next to last sentence after the word done. And it would add in the words, even though it doesn't say it in our policy manual. And then the last sentence should be, you are selling your usual stuff while you were doing it. Both of these things were said during that particular set of comments. Amy? I'm just, I guess, wanting to understand your thinking about, because I think the paragraph summarizes, you know, the context of what Lois was saying. So what you're asking for is absolute specificity in this one particular paragraph. And what I'd like to understand is why, what is it that you think is not contextualized by not including those specific details? I think what I'm suggesting there sort of speaks for itself, Jamie, that in fact, while she was going through this, she said that it doesn't say it in our board policy manual. That is an enormous lack of context relative to the overall comments that were being put in there in the record. And the same thing with the last sentence. That is an enormous amount of context around what she said during that time. And I think given that all of the other 
things that were said were put in there virtually ver verbatim, not exactly, but virtually verbatim, I think it's only fair to make sure that the items that were not put in are included to provide the full context. Well, I guess what I would say about this, Bob, is I disagree with you that it, it, there, this is not the place to have direct quotes about what Director Henry said. And that sec the second thing that you offered was exactly that. And there is nowhere in these documents where we uh, do direct quotes because these are supposed to be summary, uh, summary minutes. And if somebody cares about the details, they can go back as you have and look at uh, the tapes. I will say that, that the rest of the paragraph, like I said, is not a summary. A summary might have been uh, Director Henry commented on uh, B. Fultz's KSO, KSCO appearance or something like that. It would not have said everything else. So either we go to summary or we bring the, given the expanded nature of this particular uh, comment, we bring it out to the full context. And then I think it would also be worthwhile, given that this appeared to be something that, um, I, I, again, I don't wanna put myself in Director Henry's shoes, but it appeared to be something that she was very disturbed about, that it might be worthwhile having an agenda item to cover this sort of thing, to make sure that everybody is on the same page of understanding of what directors can or can't do within the context of well, this. Okay, now you're bringing up something totally different. If you I, want, I get that, I get if that. If you wanna do that, if you wanna do that, Bob, you send a message to Rick asking him to agendize this issue and he will do that. We are right now talking about whether we wanna make a modification of uh, the minutes. So Bob has suggested a uh, change to the minutes. Um, do we need a second for that or do we just vote on whether to adopt his change? I have other changes for the uh, for these minutes. Well, I think we should do those first. Sure. It would involve a motion and a second, Chair Mahan. Okay, so Bob, do you wanna move that? Yes, I'd like to move to add those additional phrases into the expanded um, paragraph. And those phrases would be after the word done, even though it doesn't say it in our board policy manual. And the last sentence, you are selling your usual stuff while you were doing it. Is there a second? The motion by, pardon me? I, I was gonna make a suggestion that, you know, maybe this particular topic we could revisit um, next, but you know, sorry. <laughs> Either either make a make a second or let's just let's just deal with this right. really okay I got it offered Bob you know if he wants to agendize this there's a way to do it all right is there a second the motion dies for a lack of second is there another change you would like to make Bob yes it's on page four uh, number C let's see it is eleven uh, C. Uh, B. Fultz commented that he questioned how we manage bidders. Um, I'd like to change that to um, B. Fultz commented um, that maybe bidders need additional insight into our bid submission expectations. And that is a summary because I went on for a longer period of time. Would you like to repeat that, Bob? Yes. B. Fultz commented that maybe the bidders need additional insight into our bid submission expectations. And is, would you like to move that? Yes, please. I'll second that one. And um, Chair Mayhood, um, I, I yeah. recommend getting public comment at, at some point. Oh my here. gosh, all right. <laughs> would anybody from uh, like to comment on this? Elena. Elena, go ahead. Hi, uh, Alita Lang, Boulder Creek. I guess I'm still just not, 
understanding why we have to go through minutes and meetings with the public that it's, uh, I mean, the video is out there and I'm just having a really hard time uh, with this every like several meetings that we have to like change what was a, supposed to just be a summary, that's all. Thank you. Any other comments? All right. Um, that one, I, I think it's just easiest to do them one at a time because, so um, I second that. Uh, Holly, would you like to, should we do a vote on that? We do a voice vote? Can we do a vote? President Megan? Let's do a voice vote on that. All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed? No, because I don't remember what was said and I'm not going to vote on something I don't remember. And I, I understand. So that's a no, no vote. Okay, so the it passes um, on a split vote. Could I just confirm that the district secretary got the vote for the minutes? Yes, I believe so. Everyone but Lois said yes, I think. Okay, thank you. The next one is in, yes. The next one is in D under the system-wide water line leak detection program. Uh, it says Beefold said he would like to see this done every year. Uh, Beefold said that he would. I would like to change that to Beefold said he would like to see this done at least every other year, if not every year. Uh, that's a motion. That's a motion. Anybody like to second that? I'll second it. Um, anybody want to comment on that in the public? I'll have a vo voice vote on that. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? No. No. So the, uh, the change does not pass. I'm sorry, I did Mark vote? Yes, he did. It was a no. Okay. Okay, great. That was it. Thank okay, you. Okay, thank you. Um, next, we go to um, the district reports. Are there any questions or comments on district reports? Um, I'd like to start off um, myself, um, just uh, maybe asking Rick or, or Carly. Um, we've, we've heard a lot of things in the news about sort of money starting to shake loose from the federal and the state government. So I, I kind of like to hear, um, we already heard some good news tonight about the additional um, fire related stuff. Um, so could you tell us what, um, you know, what other activities are going on and, you know, we have um, hired the grant writer and what, what she's engaged in? Yes, and uh, I do believe Carly's prepared uh, to give you a, a quick summary of our activities. Great, uh, thank you so much. Yeah, so we are working with Susan Robinson, who is our, our grant writer at this point, and she's provided a pretty detailed evaluation of all the grants and potential loans that the district has qualified for. And right now we are pursuing three grants, um, two of them close in October and then in November. So these are kind of uh, quick paced uh, pursuits, but uh, the first one is for the Bureau of Reclamation Water Smart Program. Um, this there's two different grant funding opportunities under this Water Smart uh, Program, which is the Drought Resiliency, which is up to five hundred thousand uh, dollars with a cost share of fifty percent or more. Um, and the the first project we want to pursue is redwood tank replacements. And so we actually had a call with the Bureau of Reclamation today and those projects do um, are, are, are eligible. So that's really great news. So Susan's gonna start writing up those applications and working with staff to get those put together. Um, and then we're also going to look into pursuing um, under the Water Smart Program, another grant opportunity with their Water and Energy Efficiency Grant Program. And that's up to $2 million um, with a cost share of 50%. And that's something that we would potentially pursue with the city of Santa Cruz, and that would be for AMI meter replacements. Um, so the city's going through a similar program right now, and that would be something that would make us more competitive if we could have 
something that looks more regional than just our own district. So that could be a really huge project and um, some money in for infrastructure. And then we're also pursuing um, through the Department of Water Resources, a small community grant draft drought relief program, um, which would be connecting to two smaller community water systems. There's no cost share for this program and there's no limit on the request of funding. Uh, so right now, I believe we're requesting a little over $4 million to incorporate two smaller systems. And those two smaller systems would be? They would be a, Br a Bracken Bray Water and Forest Springs. Um, both have indicated uh, a strong want to consolidate with the district and we've been working very closely um, uh, trying to obtain, uh, this would be 100% grant funding uh, for interconnections, uh, about, uh, oh, let's see, about 8,000 lineal feet of pipe to connect the two systems and replacing a, a considerable amount of pipe in our system to upgrade to be able to handle additional capacity. Uh, Bob, go ahead. Would that cover any improvements necessary in, in those two systems inside of their system? It would to bring our water up to their to their storage tanks. That's correct. But, um, but not, none of the laterals inside their system. None of the laterals. And, and both of those systems are have been very active since the CZU fire on repairs of their system. They're engaged to uh, one of the systems with FEMA and uh, the other system are, are engaged on uh, with engineering firms and so forth to replace uh, uh, their laterals and systems and, and fire hydrants. Um, I have not brought this to the board yet for approval. You know, the one thing about this grant, uh, when these things come out, you know, it's, it's a big hurry up. Uh, there will be a resolution needed uh, to apply for this grant down the road. Um, and uh, there will be uh, board authorizations and resolutions uh, moving forward with uh, consolidation of those two um, mutuals. So we're a little ahead with putting in for that grant, but what I was told, the sooner we get in, uh, the better eligibility we have. I think there's 200 million in the state of California in this bucket, um, and uh, it is definitely geared towards small water system consolidation. Mark? Yes, um, I applaud the efforts that you're doing uh, to get these grants. Um, I did want to segue to one other aspect in the environmental uh, report that Carly won't mention uh, unless I bring it up. She brought it up at the environmental committee meeting earlier this week. Um, pg &E has approached the district uh, for a riparian mitigation uh, project that they would be funding uh, because they would get uh, some credits for other work that they're doing on another one of their projects. We're looking to work with them on that. And Carly is negotiating with them to remove uh, up to five acres of uh, French broom as part of the uh, what they would need to do for us in order for us to be able to work with them on that. And I just wanted to applaud her efforts at negotiating this. Uh, good job, Carly. We're Thank very you. excited about this program. We hope it moves ahead. She has done a phenomenal job working with pg &E. So the district council, it's a kind of a unique uh, agreement moving ahead. Yes. Make them, a, make them an offer they can't refuse. <laughs> okay, Godfather. <laughs> uh, That's great. Any other comments? Are there any other uh, questions among uh the uh, members of the public about um, district reports. Seeing none, hearing none, I'll come back to members of the board. Bob? Uh, yes, just a few. Um, first for Josh. Um, Josh, what are the target dates to break ground for the Lion Pipeline and the Quail Hollow Pipeline? Lion Pipeline is still up in the air. We're still in... <laughs> We're still in development on the Lion Pipeline, so we really don't have a target date yet. On Quail Hollow, our target date, well, we are closing our construction bidding on the 30th of this month. So 
assuming that materials are available and the contract can be settled after being awarded, target date would be mid to late October to break ground on Quail Hill. Okay, great, good news, thank you. Um, Director Fultz, we got pushed back on the Lion Pipeline due to the CZU fire damage, uh, probably about another thousand feet of pipe that would be part of that. So we had to add, oh. add yes. replacement to this project. So now we're re resurveying and, and doing, um, it was cross country pipeline that will now be brought into the right of way. So we had to add to that project and it slowed it project down a little bit. Is that related to a potential new access up there as well? No. That's separate, okay. Separate. Okay. Uh, let's see. Do you have another question, Bob? Yeah, well, I think this actually might require an offline discussion with uh, Kendra. Um, the budget numbers that were shown in her report didn't match the ones in the budget that we passed the total operating expenses anyway for this year and 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 the estimated. So um, uh, Rick, is that something I can follow up separately with Kendra? Sure, uh, just CC me please with yes. your email. Absolutely. And then um, I noticed that we are still holding in a holding pattern on our um, accounts payable with our with our customers that are late. Things are not moving too bad in, in any direction. So that's at least stability. It's not getting a whole lot worse. So I'm, I'm glad to see that. Um, it'd be nice if some of that could start coming down, but at least we're not getting uh, a lot worse. So uh, appreciate your guys' efforts on, on keeping, it, keeping it that way. And Carly, did we not apply for state funds for reimbursement for delinquent accounts? We started beginning to look into it. Kendra and I filled out the initial application and we haven't heard back just yet. So hopefully we're we'll moving in that direction as well. Yeah, hopefully we'll we'll do that. And then one question for um, James. Um, we look like we're still sending a fair amount of Fall Creek water into the north system. Is that correct? Um, an, up, an update on, uh, on your director of operations operations. Uh, He's down at Dominican with his wife and their new baby son. That was delivered this morning about oh, nine hours. Congratulations. Congrats. That is huge news. Yeah. Wow. Uh, so, but anyhow, um, we uh, are taking some water. We dialed back now because uh, uh, Fall Creek service water is diminished off, but we are taking some water from Fall Creek uh, into the north system. But it has been dialed back uh, the beginning of this month considerably. Okay, yeah, because as of July, it was still showing 16 million gallons, which is a million over June. So mm -hmm. we were it, still- It's dialed back now. Okay. Uh, starting uh, the first of this month. Okay. To keep in compliance with our bypass uh, requirements at the uh, Fall Creek Diversion. When you say first of the month, you mean first of September? Yes, first of this month. We just dialed it back. Okay, got it. Okay, great. I think that was it. Thank you. Any more questions from any members of the board or from the public? If not, um, if I think we are ready to adjourn. Hearing no objections. One last comment. Um, yeah. our, an update on our staff member who was struck by a vehicle is back to work. Oh, oh good. Started back um, Monday and then doing, you know, doing as well as can be considered. Back to full. Uh, full duty uh, at her job. So we really welcomed her back and it's great to see her. That's great, wonderful. Okay, all right, thank you all. Good night. Good night everyone. Alice?